I don't know what your high school lunchroom was like, but mine was a hot mess. I mean, aside from the daily angst of navigating the social pecking order and being sure not to somehow run afoul of the unspoken seating chart, there was also the problem of Thursday's anonymous meal that we had lovingly dubbed as mystery meat. Did any of you have mystery meat in your high school? Yes, I see a lot of, yes, it was every Thursday, and I don't know why they did to this and did this to us. I mean, each week we'd poke peckishly at the rubbery substance, deep fried and shrouded in thick white gravy as if they were intentionally trying to conceal its identity. We'd work up the courage, or at least we'd try to work up the courage to ask one of the buxom hair-netted lunch ladies what it was but the death stares emanating from the counter made us think better of it every week. So, week after week, we'd just sit there and we'd ask each other, what is this? (laughs) Which is exactly what the ancient Israelites asked when they woke up one morning in the desert and found the ground covered with tiny white wavers. What is this, they asked. You see, after leaving Egypt and wandering in the Sinai Desert, they had begun complaining to Moses, and they weren't shy about it. They were complaining about the shortage of food. Oh, we wish we had died at the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt as we sat by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. But you, Moses, you had to lead us into this desert to make the whole community die of famine. (laughs) glad I wasn't Moses. Well, God heard their grumbling, and pretty soon the heavens opened and it rained down food. And it started happening every day. And the Bible says that it looked like oarfrost, like fine crystals of oarfrost in texture. And then in another place it says that it looked like coriander seed, it was white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And the people were instructed to gather only the amount that they needed for that particular day. If they tried to keep it overnight, it would rot. Except on Fridays when they could collect a double portion and save it for the next day for the Sabbath on which they were not allowed to gather any food. And from their question, what is it, or manhu in Hebrew, the mysterious substance became known as manna, manna. Manna from heaven. But that wasn't the end of the story because the Israelites, ever demanding, later started to complain again. This time they were sick of the monotony of manna. Oh, we remember the fish we used to... Do you like my overacting? Oh, we remember the fish we used to eat without cost in Egypt and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onion and the garlic... But now we see nothing before us but this manna. They were disgusted with it, the lack of variety. And they called it, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 5, wretched food. (laughs) Food that God had given them. Wretched. They were sick of it. But despite the reaction of their ancestors, later generations of Jewish people we're actually grateful for this life-saving substance. Now, there's been a lot of scientific explanations for manna. Uh, Scientists keep trying to figure out, how did this happen? And some of the explanations are that it was a swift-growing algae on the floor of the, that carpeted the floor of the desert overnight when there was dew and it was wet. Others think it was some type of fungus. My favorite one, the most recent explanation in the literature is that manna was actually the digestive byproduct of an insect feeding on plants. (laughs) Yuck. But the Israelites ultimately came to attribute it, as it should be, to a miracle from God. And it was later extolled in the Psalms as the bread of angels. And it became an essential feature of the Jewish origin story. So much so that the people that Jesus encountered in the gospel reading today used that story of manna to challenge Jesus. 
You see, Jesus had just fed thousands of people on two fish and five loaves of bread. It was a miracle, but they didn't see past the food. All the people wanted is food. They didn't see the miracle. God sent his disciples after that across the sea of Galilee in a boat. And he came later, but then the crowd showed up the next day and Jesus realized that all they wanted was more food. So he said to them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life. Now, if somebody said that to you, you might be a little confused, right? What does that mean, food for eternal life? They were confused, the people, and so they were wondering, what kind of work would you do to get food for eternal life? So Jesus explained, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. In other words, they had to believe in Jesus if they wanted food for eternal life. But then their hearts were hardened. You see, they believed in Moses. Moses was the one sent by God, not Jesus, Moses. Moses was the one who led the people out of slavery. Moses was the one who fed them in the desert with manna. So they threw that back up in Jesus' face and said, our ancestors ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they challenged Jesus and he had to set them straight. He's like, look, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It was God, my father in heaven gave them the true bread from heaven and he is the one who will give you the true bread of heaven. And so finally they seem to be convinced, they demand this bread, they say, give us this bread always and then Jesus delivers the coup de gras. I am the bread of life, he says. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Indeed, he is the one who gives nourishment and eternal life to those who believe in him. And for almost 2,000 years, Christians have considered this bread that we call the Eucharist to be life-saving. Well, we're now in the second week of this message series, a five-week message series about the meaning and the importance of the Eucharist. And we're calling this series Break Bread. Jesus instituted the Eucharist at the Last Supper and he told future generations, do this in memory of me. And so what we're doing in this series is we're looking at all the positive benefits of the Eucharist in our lives. Most people don't do things unless it has a benefit for them, right? But God knew that. And so the Eucharist actually has five benefits, five things that will improve our life, our lives, the more we receive communion. More frequently, the more frequently we receive communion, the more these effects will become apparent in our lives. And so last week we looked at the first positive benefit of receiving communion. It is generosity. Generosity. We said, you know, last week that coming to Mass is kind of like traveling through time. The past becomes present. And on this altar, the original Last Supper, happens, is brought to us in the present time. And we said that the, we literally stand at the foot of the cross and represent the sacrifice of Jesus. That original sacrifice, once and for all, where Christ laid down his life for us on the cross, becomes present on the altar again, really and substantially. It becomes present for us now. And so every time we break bread together, we get a front row seat to that generosity of Jesus on the cross and it inspires us to imitate that generosity, especially towards the poor. But there's another benefit. The first benefit, as I just said, is generosity. The second benefit, the one that we're going to look at this week, is that the Eucharist separates us from sin. Just as food restores physical strength, the body and blood of Christ strengthens our ability to love. To love. Now obviously that doesn't happen overnight, but in time it does. Little by little the Eucharist frees us from our selfish desires and it helps us to grow in virtue so that we can, as St. Paul said in the second reading, put on a new self created in God's way. So the Eucharist over time 
helps us to avoid sinning, helps us to love more in every situation. Because that's really the opposite of sin is love. But here's a question that I asked you at the beginning of Mass. What do you think is the deepest root of all evil? If you're at home, please, and you haven't done it yet, put it in the chat bar. I'd love to hear what people think. And after Mass, those of you who are here, tell me what you think. What do you think is the root of all evil? The author of the letter to Timothy said that the root of all evil is the love of money. Other people say that it's really pride or anger or greed or any of the other classically defined deadly sins. There's seven of them. But what I found interesting is that the founder of the Jesuit order of priests, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, you know, he did the spiritual exercises, very famous saint. He wrote that the origin of all evil is none of those things. The origin, the deepest root, the bedrock of evil in our lives is our ingratitude, our lack of gratefulness to God. We sin because we're not sufficiently aware of God's goodness or the enormous blessings with which he showers us every day. Ignatius says that if we actually understood this, that, that we were blessed at every moment, if we actually recognized everything that God has given us, we would always return God's love with love and we would not sin. We would not be greedy, we would not be angry, we would not be prideful or love money inordinately. And if that's true, if you accept that, if, and I do, I like that explanation, I mean it seems to be the deepest root of everything, evil, then ask this second question. If gratitude is the cause of, ingratitude is the cause of sin, what's the cure? It's the Eucharist. It's the Eucharist. The Eucharist must be the cure for ingratitude, the lack of gratefulness to God, because the Eucharist is in itself a sacrifice of praise to God. In fact, the Greek word for Eucharist literally means thanksgiving. And as the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the Eucharist is a blessing, meaning we bless God. It's a blessing by which the church expresses her gratitude to God for all his benefits, for all he has accomplished. And that's exactly what Jesus did at the Last Supper. He expressed gratitude and thanks to God. Look at the Gospel of Mark with me for a second. Here's what it says in chapter 14. While they were eating, he took bread, he said the blessing, good words, the eulogy, blessing God, He broke the bread, he gave it to them, and he said, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and what did he do? He gave thanks. Eucharistesis in Greek. Eucharist. He gave thanks, and he gave the cup to his disciples. They all drank from it, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. You see, Jesus spoke a prayer of blessing over the bread and a prayer of thanksgiving, or Eucharistia, over the cup. Did you know in the Jewish tradition, blessing God is not a bad thing. Like some people think, how can you bless God? God blesses us. It's, it's blasphemous to try to bless God, but that's not true. In the Jewish tradition, blessing God is not, something, is not something that's bad. In fact, it's something you should and must do. Blessing God and praising him in thanksgiving must be a part of daily life. In fact, the Talmud it, 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 the kind of the guidebook for the Jewish religion other than the, first, uh, the, the Old Testament of the Bible, the Talmud says that it is forbidden for the human person to enjoy anything that comes from this world without blessing God first. It's why we say thanks to God before we eat. It's why we pray to God and thank him for a new day when we wake up in the morning. It's why we thank God at night before we go to bed. We're thanking him for the sleep we're going to have. We thank him for the life we're going to have the next morning. We thank him for the food. Everything that comes from God, must, God must receive thanks for it and must be blessed. And so we should not receive anything without first speaking a Eucharistia to God, praising him and thanksgiving. 
And here's something that's really cool. I think this is so cool, but then I'm a religious nerd. Maybe you won't, but let's see. A traditional form of the Jewish blessing over a meal goes something like this. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator of the world, you who bring forth bread from the earth, blessed are you forever, Lord our God. Now, doesn't that sound an awful lot like what the priest says over the bread and wine as he's preparing the altar with gifts? Here's what he says, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. And you all say, blessed be God forever. That is how we begin our Eucharist, with great thanksgiving. One other cool thing I want to point out. Malachi, chapter 1, verses 11. It's a, it's a book in the Old Testament. He was a prophet, Malachi. And he predicted that one day, from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, God's name would be great among the nations, and everywhere they will bring sacrifice to my name and a pure offering. Now ask yourself this, what pure offering could human beings ever give to God? What pure offering could we give? Well, we believe that wherever on earth the Eucharist is celebrated, this prophecy is fulfilled. In fact, we're going to use the third Eucharistic prayer today. So listen for this. It says in there these exact words. From the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice is offered to your name. Straight out of Malachi. Because we believe that Jesus in the bread and the wine is the perfect blessing and the purest sacrifice we could ever offer to God in gratitude for all he has given us. And it is through the perfect, grateful expression of the Eucharist that we are separated from sin. We grow in gratitude and ever so slowly learn to live and love like Jesus. You know, each year, I look forward to the holidays. I know it's kind of early, but they're only four months away. I love it when the air begins to thin and chill and the leaves fall and the days darken and our thoughts start to turn to light and warmth of heart, hearth and home. And there's something profoundly pure about the mass on Thanksgiving Day. Here at 10 a.m. every Thanksgiving day, we celebrate a mass. It's not a day of obligation. Catholics don't have to come. Attendance is not required. And yet hundreds flock to church on Thanksgiving morning. Before the games begin, before the turkey and the wine and the pecan pie. And they take a moment and they give thanks to the creator of all that exists and from whom everything has been given. On that day, in the church, there is no complex theology to explain. There's no abstract mysteries of God to unpack. All of that complexity of our faith is stripped away and the central tenet of what we believe comes to the fore. And the core meaning of the meal we share every Sunday is reduced to one simple, pure exchange of love. God blesses us and we give Eucharist. We give thanks.